My question's pretty, um, well, pretty simple. I just want to focus on clinical data. So whether that's coming from RDTs, whether that's coming from ELISA assays, point of care, uh, the big analyzers, and I'm talking in field, those data streams that are coming out, um, I guess the question is threefold. Um, how open are those in terms of sharing that data across regions to inform evidence for, for policy? How open is that? Um, I guess the second question is, do we need an honest data broker in terms of all, that, all the various data streams coming out? Who needs to be managing that? And then the third question, I guess, is should that be private sector? Should it be a public body? Should it be a supernatural agency? Who should that you know, be, be with? So I'd like to ask that to Blaine first because he's closest. <laughs> um, I think, to be honest, Looking at it initially, some of the countries we've been talking to, for example, Honduras, which would be smaller than Brazil, they look towards managing it themselves and being very much sharing it throughout the, the, the country. But then you can see countries like Brazil who like to keep their states very, very separate from each other. So there's going to be aspects of that. Um, in terms of actually a broker, I think we haven't looked into that, but definitely it's a very good idea simply for the fact that um, I mean, this data obviously is very valuable and can be used for, for many, many reasons and it can also be exploited. So definitely someone should be a, a broker in between. Okay. And should it come from private or public or is, I suppose that's kind of your I think that? in Latin America, as it stands right now, the private sector is, is very, very bad for, for sharing yeah. anything with, with each other and, and with the public sector, so definitely not. Okay. I think it would be more of a public play. Oh, okay. The same question to, to Andrew, simply because you're... Second in line. Yeah, second in line. Okay. Firing um, line. Yeah, well, I kind of agree with Blaine, really. I mean, you know, we're a Green Mesh is a technology company, so we don't take ownership of the data. We're just enabling the capture and um, use of the data. Uh, so in terms of what happens with the data, it's really down to our, uh, our clients to work out between them what they're, um, they're going to do with it. Um, I think there is a, there's certainly a push now within the whole community to make data open and um, reusable. Um, Certainly within countries, I think um, ministries uh, are starting, certainly in the countries we work with, they're, they're starting to understand the benefits of sharing. They want to see what works and what doesn't work in other countries, and um, in order to you know, get, you really need to give. So uh, I think that's, that, that's becoming a more, you know, that, that, that all the talk in the um, sort of mobile health tech space in developing countries is all about, you know, open data sharing. Um, there's various formats being put forward as to, you know, your, if your data is available in this format, it can be used by yeah. anybody. So uh, in terms of how the private sector fits in, uh, again, I think I agree with Blaine that, you know, uh, um, it's more likely to come through uh, academia, a combination of, you know, um, forward thinking people in academic institutions combined with the, uh, combined with the, um, appropriate people in the ministries. Okay, thank you for that, Andrew. Harriet, from your interdisciplinary um, kind of viewpoint. Um, so I suppose we're very lucky we have a, a really strong relationship with the Africa Health Research yeah. Institute in uh, South Africa and have come across no problems working with them. But I suppose we don't work with countries per se, but um, in terms of individual sharing of health data over mobile phones. Um, I think there's a real lack of understanding um, of what people are sharing every day over their mobile phones. And um, I think there needs to be a lot of increased awareness because people say, oh, I don't want to share this aspect of my health data, but they're sharing a lot more kind of intimate um, yeah. things every day. Mm. So there's a real kind of Challenge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you mentioned ethical considerations yeah. in your. Uh, I was very interested to hear about that, simply because when you're mapping that out across the region, how those different ethical interplays are going to affect um, that. But that's, uh, thank you for that answer. Um, I just want to push out to the audience. Yeah. Uh, I never encountered the issue of actually wanting to know the 
shown the government that after the program failed. So we heard that uh, in a couple of uh, countries where some officers were not so keen necessarily in implementing surveillance data for the Indians specifically because they were afraid that you know bad data would come up. So have you ever you know seen companies have you ever encountered any comments like that? Uh, yeah, I have <laughs> in uh, in lots of countries. Um, yeah, that's one of the frustrating things we come across. Yeah, as I say, you know, we're a technology provider, so you know, we're we're there to do the job for the client, and our clients are often um, you know, large implementing NGOs or their um, big private sector companies or their or their ministries. And yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of um, people reluctant to individual people reluctant to share data because it's going to reflect badly on them. I've, you know, we've got an issue in one particular country we're working in where in one region the managers or the uh, regional directors and the district health managers have, uh, have almost vetoed the use of the system because they, they're, they're in such a mess that they, they, they don't want that mess to become visible. So rather, and it's kind of a backward looking thought process because you know, rather than saying okay well we know we're in a mess, having visibility of the mess will enable us to take some positive action and sort it out. They, they just kind of put the shutters down. So yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's, it's the reality sometimes of life on the ground and it's very, uh, very frustrating. And you need, you, it all boils down to people. You need strong people to get in there and make things happen. Um, and you know, we're lucky that we work with some really good clients who you've got those people, but it, you know, we still come across pockets of resistance. Um, people have got their own motives for Stopping data becoming public. Uh, would you like to add anything to that, Nita Pandas? I'm kind of thinking about it. Um, <coughs> I guess the fairest way to say this, I have experienced a little bit of it with a particular group of people who are collaborating with um, a large multinational. And I mean, they actually did promote the product for as long as they were collaborating. And as the collaboration, I suppose, the, the funding dried up. Um, I suppose their mood very much changed against that uh, that multinationalist product. Um, so I think yeah, there is an element of I suppose bias when uh, when multinationals are involved and, and I suppose political influence. That's as much as I'm going to say. Okay. Uh, there's some, a question from Jim Mullery. For uh, my my question is so much as a testimonial. My R&D team in California was no post signal. They love being in a manual software. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, experience uh, with it developing uh, diagnostic assays, and uh, it's, uh, it's been successful, very successful so far. Great day. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> mm -hmm. Brilliant. Looking forward to your speech a bit later as well, Jim, as well. Um, yeah. I think Robert from the National History Museum is interested in the next question. First of all, congratulations to all three speakers for some really interesting uh, ideas and data. I think my question is particularly uh, for, for Andrew because I'm, I am interested in mass drug administration and implementation of control programs in some of these very difficult settings. Uh, and I find your presentation very stimulating and uh, really would like to follow up on it. Uh, but I was just wondering, because we're, many people are very uh, overwhelmed by data management mm -hmm. at that kind of local level. What kind of capacity building is needed? What kind of training is needed to get people really involved with the implementation of the system? Um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it really depends what what their involvement is. I mean, the guys on the ground who are conducting the census and, um, uh, and sending in the the distribution data. Um, the training's very limited. I mean, we, we always try and keep things as simple as possible. That's number one. You know, the simpler you can make it, the more likely people are to engage. So um, you know, when we started with site savers in um, Cameroon, the only thing, the only sort of communication channel that was available to us was SMS. So we just broke the indicators that they needed to send in down into some simple codes. You know, A means this, B means that, C means that, and then you follow each code by the number that you've got on your piece of paper that you've been writing down as you go around. Um, and they tend to pick that up within a couple of hours. I mean, funnily enough, the, the biggest 
hurdle we had to overcome during the training process was teaching people to text um, because in a lot of uh, these countries the um, uh, well, in, in some parts of like in Cameroon that country that people hadn't been using their mobile phones to text they'd just been using them to make phone calls um, so we had to you know if, if, let's say we put aside a morning for training two hours of that morning was taken get, just getting people comfortable with texting and finding the characters on their keyboard because some of these little phones are tiny and if you're asking them to use letters um, they've got to, you know, you've got to, you, you've got to input that letter several times to get to the letter that you need. So, <coughs> so it's, it's, you know, kind of almost unforeseen things like that. You have to kind of work around. Um, but in terms of the, the data transmission, it's very simple. And, and as we've, um, you know, over the years that we've been doing this, more and um, you know, better, easier to use network services become available. So in Nigeria, with Sight Savers, they're using. Um, they're still using uh, basic mobile handsets to transmit the data from the field, but we've been able to use uh, different channels called USSD, and it basically means that we can open up a session. So it's, um, you, you, again, just with a basic handset, you just dial, when you're ready to submit your data, you just dial a, a session number, so it's like 150 star hash hash, something like that. Um, and then the Mango system then um, pushes down in real time a set of questions in the real language saying how many people have you seen um, today how, you know how many you know it's basically you're asking them proper questions and then they just put in a number in response to the question and the questions in their local language and then that you know that data collection process might take 30 seconds or a minute uh, and then they just end the session or when they put in the last answer the session ends um, so it's <coughs> it's really simple and, and again that re that reduces the, the training kind of burden at that end it's at the as you kind of move up the sort of data chain if you like um, and you're getting into the program management team who may not have had access to um, you know, more of a sophisticated reporting system before that's where you need to spend a bit more time and that can be a day or two of sitting down with them to, un to, to, to the, so they can see um, you know, what the data is, how to interpret it, uh, what actions to take if they see something that's wrong. Um, but again, you know, it's a couple of days exercise at the start of the program. Um, I mean, we're lucky insofar as we've got a guy on our team who used to work for Science Savers. He was the program manager for the MDAs for Science Savers. He, after the initial exercise, he joined us. So he's now our training guy for all of the MDA activities. So he's, you know, he's been at the front end and, uh, and now he's at the you know, he's been the poach turned gamekeeper, if you like, or, or the other mm -hmm. way around. Um, but yeah, the, <coughs> it, it's not that complicated. It just um, it's it's matching the training to you know, the role within the process uh, and keeping it as simple as possible. Could I could I morph that question, David, onto uh, um, to to Harriet from an upstream perspective? And we heard very much about a deployment level, um, yeah. you know, resource capacity uh, issue. From an upstream, you're working with very complex technology, CMOS, the embedded systems, the quantum dots, the nano materials. Um, you're active with the Africa Centre. Is there a research capacity issue at any of this uh, for you? Um, that's a good question. I think um, we're very lucky that the Africa Centre is quite well provided for. It's, um, it's actually it's now in a combination of two separate institutes, and it's actually funded by Wellcome and a host of other um, centres. But Absolutely. I mean, the area itself is um, inc incredibly in need of capacity building, and obviously, you know, the wider area, uh, moreover. Um, but I think, uh, in terms of accessing kind of end users, and because um, we basically we would prefer for people to be self testing, yeah. so we're we're actually trialing um, uh, an HIV self te testing app that links to clinical pathways okay. in South Africa um, sometime in the next few months mm. um, and obviously a massive component of that will be how complex can the app be um, in order for anyone to yeah. pick it up and use it without any training at all mm. and that is a massive challenge mm. because you know there are things that you just don't think of like for example not having experienced texting before um, and then there's you know if you're taking a photo of a test then there's a whole host of uh, issues around that and image capture that we really have to account for okay. so it's, it's a challenge it's a challenge that's interesting um any other questions from the audience please um no again fascinating work really enjoyed it um just um linking a little bit actually this is point linking a little bit with the uh, comments of the questions that we had yesterday where we tried to find commonalities between different interpretations and the different partnerships. I'm wondering how can we combine all the three different presentations we had today in a single uh, stream of you know of management tool that actually you know, collects the data from the diagnostic point of view, 
and we found all these information, feedback information to the people, because it's something that we normally need to forget the uh, feedback loop. We don't tell the guys on the ground how they're performing and how they want to perform. So I'm just wondering, you know, how we can integrate these three pieces together, whether or not having just a piecewise approach to all these things, that would be an idea. And the other, the other comment I, I'd like to, or the question I had is, love the, uh, the way you, uh, Andrew, presented the, the benefits and added values of, of this tool. When do you quantify these things? Because at the end of the day, the decision maker and the ministry will have to decide whether the system brings more value for money than a And I'm just wondering if you quantify these things. I, I recognize that you mentioned about $70,000 savings from, from one of the projects. What, what about the other things, the other benefits that you mentioned? Sure. Okay, <coughs> two great questions. Thanks very much. The, um I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take this if you like. <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of the first question about integration, that, um, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, uh, that, yeah, there, there's mileage to be had in integrating these solutions. I mean, we've already done some work, I think I mentioned with Amiga, a company called Amiga Diagnostics, and they, they've created a, an art rapid diagnostic test kit for CD4. Um, which unfortunately I think has been superseded now, but the, the, the object of the exercise is they, it's their point of care tool. We created an application that could read that point of care tool, uh, enable the, uh, the clinician or the health worker to put in some additional data about the patient based on the result that they'd seen to refer the patient on for either further testing or, or put them onto a treatment program and update the client record and then push that kind of record through a, a workflow. So that was a, you know, a, a, a one integration that we've done. We do a lot of work of, um, you know, we, we'd like to talk to these guys about their, their point of care tools and in, incorporate that into, um, you know, it's, it's an obvious thing to do to bring these tools together. Um, I was here, well, I was at the London School recently talking to, there's an organization there called Peak Vision and they've created some really nice eye care tools on Android applications. And, and they're, you know, they're, <coughs> they're, 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 all these tools are built to be part of an ecosystem. So, you know, those kind of almost like triage tools, um, you know, the findings from the triage exercise need to be reported and acted upon and people need to be, you know, who have found positive for a certain condition need to be referred on and tracked. So, yeah, all those things are now coming to Connectivity is, is um, kind of the buzzword, if you like. Um, and, yeah, we're very much kind of behind that. We, we you know, the, I, you know, I've never really looked at the numbers, but probably half of our clients have now started to integrate Mango with one thing or another, right? you know, either at the front end with these diagnostic type tools or at the back end with other systems, you know, logistics management systems, so we can share data about the, you know, the commodity tracking uh, or things like DHIS2, district health information systems, so we can push client data into a more comprehensive client file that covers programs other than the ones that we're working with, so yeah, connectivity is a big deal. Um, in terms of the the uh, cost-benefit analysis that you're kind of referring to, and your second question, yeah, that, that's something that is kind of a pet subject of mine, is how, you know, how do we present our, you know, how do we kind of encourage people that it's a good idea to take on these technologies? I mean, Science Savers were pretty good because they shared their, um, their findings with us. To, you know, they showed their increased coverage, uh, their reduction in time in the field, and the um, cost savings. Uh, <coughs> And it's kind of a client by client thing to, to provide accurate, meaningful, kind of reliable case studies like that with some bottom line. We, we need a lot of input from the client because they need to share with us what their findings are. How much was it costing you before? How much is it costing you now? Um, how much was it time was it taking? How much is it taking you now? Uh, and <coughs> with, they're all well meaning, they all want to help, but they're all busy doing other things. So we, we've actually found it quite hard to get accurate. Um, feedback from clients to, to help with those but so you know we, we, we often use anecdotal evidence to support it and often as not when we're talking to potential clients they know what their problems are and the, and the benefits that we're talking about kind of ring a lot of bells and they can you know, they can do the calculations uh, themselves and, and, and again in many cases we are responding to requests for proposals so again someone's already done the homework they know they need some help and they, they, they anticipate significant benefits. But yeah, if we could, if we could um, create a library of case studies that are you know, properly costed, that would be fantastic for, for the clients and for us as well. Yeah. A useful sales tool. So. Do you want to add to that? I think just, just to add to it slightly, just a sentence is, is much like you said. I think to integrate the three projects and the three companies like ours together, you 
won't do it just ourselves. It has to be with the stakeholders on the ground, and I think that's the most important thing is to, to take in, I suppose, the, the knowledge that is there. Because, I mean, take for example ourselves, we recently started working with, uh, seven months ago, with a, an epidemiologist based completely in Brazil. I mean, we learned things from, a, you know, a chat over coffee with her um, that we probably haven't, it would have took us three months to learn. So I think there's a lot of knowledge on the ground that shouldn't be taken for granted. And, uh, I mean, I suppose to, I'd like to ask Harry the same question, but in a different guise, in the sense that what we're talking about here is actually partnerships, isn't it? What's, and this was touched upon yesterday. You've got very a complex um, mixture of different um, disciplines that form my sense. What makes it work? Um, good question. Uh, I suppose um, we you really need to bear in mind that it is quite, yeah, it's upstream and um, there's we're just hoping that as long as we you know optimize each different facet so yeah. the nanomaterials the lateral flow assays the kind of the app interfaces the ethical frameworks and then at some point they will all come together it's yeah. it's definitely a challenge um i just wanted to answer I think someone asked about how does it feed into like online yeah. um, platforms so it's not through a diagnostic test but in South Africa, we have an online dashboard for, um, Rosanna mentioned the 1990-90 targets earlier for HIV, and um, it's, a, it's a large kind of study area in Kwazulu Natal where every single individual is kind of um, surveyed every year, and according to you know, whether they are, uh, what their HIV status is, if they are HIV positive, whether they're on treatment or not, and if they're on treatment, whether they're virally suppressed. And all of that information is on an online dashboard and it feeds into the Ministry of Health. So that's an example, although it's not from like directly from diagnostics, it's kind of an example of it, you know, being available for anyone to look at. And um, yeah. Cool. Thank you for that answer, Harry. I mean, I'd like to spin, I'm mean, just going to come to the last question, I guess. Um, there'll be time for someone to ask questions from the audience, but I just wanted to spin this backwards a bit from the panel to the audience in the sense that we're speaking about collected data, right? But what about data that's already in existence in terms of the NGOs <clears throat> and the various longitudinal data, the case studies you've got, the case managements you've got? I know we've got the Leprosy Mission England, Ireland, Wales here, as well as MSF. Um, so I'd like to ask the Leprosy Mission um, in terms of your viewpoint on the potential role of the NGO in this kind of data puzzle. Yes, yeah. I'm Sorry. Sheila from the Leprosy Mission England. Um, yes, you're correct, we do collect data and we do collect a lot of case studies, but at the moment a lot of our case studies are going in to be shared with the United Nations for their SDG collection to show where we are impacting our work to meet the SDG criteria. Um, within ourselves, though, we are looking at how we manage and collect data for diagnostics. Obviously, for the diagnostics for leprosy, it's a difficult thing to, to yeah. attend culture, but it is an area that we are looking into, um, and it is an area that we're kind of thinking which way is best to go around it. Obviously, making sure the data we do offer is shared across the whole of yeah. the kind of leprosy fellowship, if you will. Mm. So even though leprosy mission sits underneath a leprosy fellowship which is all around the world yeah. globally and um, through the University of Netherlands at the moment whatever small data we have we collect and we share but kind of sitting here I'm quite conscious that it needs to be shared wider sometimes because yeah. it's not just leprosy data we'll collect, we'll collect data on trachoma and we'll end up collecting data yeah. on LF as well which stays in our little hub and not really shared out unless we need to go back to it I mean, we're entering territory into co-infections, co-morbidities, so absolutely. And yeah. that's something that Lawrence touched upon as well. Lawrence, if you don't mind, from, your, from MSF's perspective, um, <clears throat> data that's already collected, how does that fit into everything that we're talking about? And I'm sorry to detract from the panel, but I think it's an interesting um, mirror. <clears throat> yeah, I will not hide that that's collection is a big disaster in MSF. It's very complex mm. uh, because the end user, uh, I don't know if they are fearing or whatever, but uh, we are working now with the DHS2 platform mm. that give a bit more of, of real-time, meaning when I mean by 
Barcelona I can see on specific mission yeah. and, and follow some pattern but uh, the main problem is it's how the end user is entering the data yeah. so that that's also maybe one of our lesson learned it's it's when you build this kind of platform uh, it's often a top down what we call a top down decision yeah. meaning it's people from the headquarter in MSF with a group of of specialists around that define what will be the optimal database and, and what needs to be collected. Mm. And at the end, it's it's often totally disconnected from the reality. Yeah. And people don't understand why they have to fill so many uh, documents and why they have to send so many documents. So that's uh, one of the things. I, I think it is important on the, on the development of, of these kind of things to already involve the people that are going to use it and for them to, to feel part of, of, of the whole process and, and then to get better outcome. And then on the other side, how we use it. We use it for, for let's say, our internal reports, but also external, yeah. some, some advocacy plan. Um, what we face is sometimes with sensitive data, mm. especially related to outbreak, um, we cannot share yeah. more because the government, the typical example it's today there are ongoing outbreak of cholera in Ethiopia we cannot, even if the government have the data and provide the data they will totally refuse to admit that cholera is existing so yeah. there, there are also whatever you generate in, in sometimes in some platform it's even impossible to, uh, to share this so it's, it's make the things much more complex. And the last thing um, <coughs> that for us is very important, it's now we are speaking of data collection, but I think this kind of, of tools and platforms could be also useful on feedback. Yeah. You know, to, to what I was saying, it's if the, the diagnostic is centralized in a reference laboratory, the most complex is how do you bring back the result to the patient. Yeah. So on, it, it should be for data collection, but it should be widely used for others. Uh, alert system, we use similar platform for vector control in China yeah. in Bolivia, where when somebody saw the triatomine in home, yeah. they can activate by a simple SMS and say, I think somebody needs, yeah. and, and then you activate the process. So there, there are many use. I mean, apart from, from the pure data collection, which at the end, yeah, I don't know how many people really interpret it well yeah. looking when you see the thousands of data that are collected. Thank you very much for that, Lawrence, and Shabina, in terms of the reportage line uh, potential. Um, would there be any other questions? Please feel free. Ah, Rosanna, brilliant. Partnership, leadership yeah. is really important so that we don't 
all of a sudden start to have many different data management systems that don't talk to each other. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and, and for, for us, our pilot was based on an open source middleware solution that could draw that data from each one of the company clouds. Uh, but we, we had to work with the companies to, to do that. And uh, it would be nice if there is some open system that hmm. everybody start to subscribe to and start to make things a lot easier. Perhaps that might be the next revolution. <laughs> We have, we've had it in drug discovery, so starting clinical trials, so let's hopefully it'll carry on. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, thank you very, very much for, to the panelists for some brilliant speeches, as well as taking time to sit here. Uh,